Hello, kembali lagi bersama pembawa acara kalian Yohanis Lamere dan selamat datang kembali di program Earth Optimism. Pandemi global COVID-19 yang terjadi sekarang ini mendorong kita semua untuk menyadari pentingnya kesehatan. Hari ini kita akan mempelajari lebih dalam mengenai topik ini. Namun sebelumnya, mari kita lihat proyek para ilmuwan Smithsonian yang disebut One Health atau Sehat Untuk Semua. My name is Mark Valatuto. I am a wildlife veterinarian for the Smithsonian's Global Health Program. We are driving something called One Health. We are looking at the interaction between humans, animals, and the environment. The vast majority of emerging infectious diseases come from wildlife. SARS, MERS, Ebola, Zika virus now, avian influenza. So these are some of the big scares that we have today. And as veterinarians, we can take part in preventing this from happening by understanding the wildlife. We work with our partners within the country to find areas that are of concern. We are evaluating for the first time in this country the viruses that originate in these species and also looking at how they may transfer to livestock or domestic species and humans. We collect samples from wildlife and livestock and the humans. Once we have that information, we pair that up with modeling that can make a statement saying the people that are exposed to animals in this method or have these kinds of practices, they're the ones that are most likely to have exposure to this virus or this virus or this virus. That's when we have the opportunity to change behaviors. We did a wide search looking for people that have the background that we need. With that background, we're able to understand how to navigate the culture You have to take some time to understand the people, to understand what values they have. So when you present your work, you're not presented in a way that is offensive and is also something that agrees with the work that they've been trying to do. By studying pandemics, we can protect an animal, we can protect the people, and we can protect the environment. That's the basis for One Health. Kita sudah mendengar banyak sekali berita dan fakta mengenai kelelawar dan hubungannya dengan banyak sekali virus. Mari kita nonton dua film pendek yang menceritakan hubungan antara kelelawar dan kesehatan umat manusia. Fruit bats are beautiful, beautiful animals. Watching them fly through the air is amazing. They're so graceful. They're amazing in terms of seed dispersal. We are in a rural town in Myanmar. My name is Jen. I'm a veterinarian with the Smithsonian Global Health Program. I've been out here trying to place tracking collars on some of the world's largest flying foxes. Not only are bats known to be carriers of rabies, they're also known to carry a lot of other diseases such as Nifa and Hendra, and a lot of other emerging infectious diseases that we still have not yet identified. Our goal is to be able to find out what diseases in particular are these bats carrying, as well as follow them across their very large migration pathways to see where are these diseases moving across the country and across the globe. Mammals do carry diseases that other mammals can get. That disease is able to cross species and get a human being sick. They're eating from their fruit trees, they're sharing a lot of the produce. It's a lot of direct contact, and that's a perfect setup where you can have a virus that can hop species and become infectious to people. We will be taking biological samples to screen these bats for different viral diseases that they may be carrying. My name is John McAvoy and I am a movement ecologist. GPS collars really have taken things a big step forward in our knowledge. We can know a lot more about their movement and their behavior than we previously did. We're tracking them so we can learn about where they move in relation to humans. Where do these bats, which are important vectors for disease, where do they travel? We came up with a way to get a collar that can remotely download all of our information. It will track the GPS movements of these animals. It will track the ambient temperature at the time as well to see if they're seeking out particular environments. The collars are designed with a weak link that will break down biologically over time and will fall off. And that way, not only can we follow the movement of the bats, we can follow movement of disease in these populations. This particular site where we're at, the tree is right across the street from a restaurant. There's food carts all over. There's a lot of feral dogs that are running around. So there's a lot of different types of exposure pathways. It's about 3 a.m. We set up everything. 
and now we have to wait for the bats to come back from their foraging activities, hopefully within the next few hours. They will all be back by daybreak, which should be at about 5.30 a.m. It's just a waiting game at this point. They're just coming in for the morning. And they've been out foraging all night, so there's a lot of shuffling about as the bats are trying to get settled into their roosts for the day and making sure that they want to be sharing a branch with who they want to share a branch with. We do want to protect them. They're not a bad animal to have, but at the same token, we just want people to be careful and know how to prevent things from happening. By figuring out where are these diseases coming from, we're able to hopefully stop future outbreaks as well as really help the people that live with these animals to live in a safe way. This is Lino Cave, located in Pa'an, Myanmar. We have identified this location because there's a number of cave systems here, all in limestone karsts. At the cave sites, you have bats. Lino, which literally means bat in Burmese, is the home to more than 500,000 bats that emerge each night at dusk in a most dazzling display. Visitors from all over the world come here to catch a glimpse of this incredible spectacle. Lino Cave is also a sacred Buddhist shrine and serves as a pilgrimage site for many people of Myanmar. The cave also attracts many community members for another reason, bat feces, more commonly known as guano. For at least three generations, a single family has been collecting guano from this cave to sell throughout the country for use as fertilizer, much like how cow manure is used in other parts of the world. You can see people walk through the caves barefoot, collect guano with their bare hands, and introduce the guano to farms all over Myanmar for livestock and vegetable growth. These practices raise many concerns to us as wildlife veterinarians because of the viruses that may be transmitted from bats to humans like rabies and Ebola. We at the Smithsonian's Global Health Program are interested in these interfaces between bats and humans because it can tell us a lot about emerging infectious diseases and how they move between species. This makes Lino Cave a perfect research site for us as we try to better understand these infectious disease risks. Before dusk, we set up nets to catch about 100 bats as they depart from the cave. Next, our team of trained Myanmar veterinarians and animal handlers get to work. We identify the species, weigh, collect blood samples, and swab each bat before releasing them, so we could test them for zoonotic viral diseases they may be carrying. We also collect similar biological samples from people and livestock living near these bats to evaluate for the very same viruses. Already, our teams have discovered new forms of coronaviruses that were previously unknown to Myanmar bat populations. We can provide this information to the government of Myanmar and offer guidance on policy development and community education that is both respectful of the Myanmar culture and reduces risks for disease transmission. We believe this will ultimately keep bats safe as well as the people that depend on them. I'm so pleased to introduce Dr. James Hassel to our program. He is a wildlife vet with the Smithsonian Global Health Program. Welcome, Dr. Hassel. Do we know why animals in the wild are a source of human disease? So thanks, Johannes, and thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak about this. Um, yes, we do. Um, and I think you can break this into, you can kind of break this down into two, two sections or two questions. Firstly, why do wildlife carry so many pathogens? And secondly, how are people exposed to those pathogens? And in very simple terms, the reason that wildlife host a lot of pathogens that can cause disease is because there are so many different species of wildlife on the planet. So each of these species of animal, and I think it's simple to probably focus on mammals here, they've evolved with their own unique set of, um, of pathogens. So as humans, we have our own set of viruses and bacteria. Um, as do domestic animals like, like dogs or pigs um, or cows, for example. 
Um, but together, humans and livestock really only make up a, a tiny proportion of the total number of wildlife or animal species on the planet, about 0.2%. So the other 99.8%, which is about 6,900 species, which we collectively refer to when we're talking about wildlife, they, they host many more pathogens um, than, than people, simply because there are so many of them. So that, that goes some way to explaining why there are lots of pathogens in wildlife. Um, but obviously, what's really important as well is how humans are exposed to, um, to the diseases that wildlife can carry. And here it's useful to think about, um, about our ancestors who used to live in nature, so in forests and grasslands, where they would have lived in really close contact with wildlife and therefore regularly caught um, diseases and shared diseases with them. So while most of us today um, have put a lot of distance between ourselves and wildlife in the form of roads or buildings um, that we encounter in cities, that doesn't stop our, um, sorry, their pathogens from being able to affect us if we're exposed to them. Um, but also the pathogens um, that we have can also affect them. And that's, that's why we use the term one health to represent that us as humans and animals like wildlife can share pathogens and therefore can also set, share the same diseases. So in terms of um, what are the risky human behaviors that can expose us to the diseases that wildlife carry? Well, um, those I'll give you a couple of examples of, um, of, of some of these behaviors that, that people um, take part in that can, um, can expose us to these diseases. So the first is eating wildlife as a source of food. So in some parts of the world, people either rely on or, um, or choose to eat wildlife. And in the process of catching these animals in the forest and preparing them to eat, that offers a great opportunity for their pathogens, particularly viruses, to cross into people via, for example, blood or, their, or saliva. The same is also true of um, what we call the exotic pet trade. And this exists to supply the demand for people in different parts of the world who want to keep these very exotic, unusual wildlife species as pets. Um, and many of these animals that you, you'll be familiar, and in Indonesia, these might be orangutans or, or exotic parrots, um, they're captured in the wild and then kept in poor conditions where they're often mixed with animals from lots of other places. And this provides a perfect breeding ground for the pathogens that they carry um, to then multiply and be passed on to, to people when they decide to keep them as pets. So if they can expose us to disease, why should we care about protecting wildlife like orangutans, bats and rodents? That's a great question. And I think it's um, so obviously there's, you know, a lot of people have emotional connections and there are ethical reasons to really want to protect um, animals like orangutans. But there are also two really important practical reasons um, for which we should care about protecting these animals, even though they can carry pathogens and potentially make people sick. Um, so the first is that many of the human activities I just spoke about, so hunting wildlife for food or catching them for, um, to keep them as pets, obviously they can expose people to, um, to the diseases that they carry. So by encouraging people not to take part in these activities, and providing alternatives, so alternative sources of food, for example, um, these wildlife are being protected, um, but also the chances of their diseases infecting or coming into contact with people are being reduced, and therefore that passes on that benefit to the rest um, of the human population. The second really important reason is that most wild animals actually play really important roles in the health and a normal function of the um, the habitats they live in, like tropical forests. And we call these benefits um, ecosystem services. So using we can use bats as an example. Bats across the world, in Indonesia, but also many other countries, they, they're responsible for pollinating the flowers of over 500 plants. And that includes um, fruit like mango, banana, even durian. Um, so without these bats, many of those fruits simply wouldn't exist. And while some bats eat fruit and nectar, others, um, others eat insects such as mosquitoes. So, for example, there's a bat in North America called the little brown bat, which can eat up to a thousand mosquitoes in a single hour. 
Um, and this is an example of, a, of an ecosystem service because mosquitoes carry many human diseases like malaria. So having bats there to eat them and reduce the number of mosquitoes that can spread diseases to people um, helps to, to protect human health. Um, and then larger mammals like orangutans, they also perform ecosystem services. So they carry and disperse seeds around forests. And in doing so, they can actually maintain the health of the forest and its ability to regenerate in, in future generations. Now, we have two questions from students in Indonesia who are participating in the U.S. Embassy's English Access Program. Let's see what they have to ask us. Hi, my name is Ahmad from Junior Hex School Wanata Lampu, and I'm the participant of U.S. Embassy's English Access Micro Scholarship Program. So, I would like to know, what kind of technology does a veterinarian use to treat animals? Thank you. That's a really good question, um, and the answer is probably less exciting than it should be. Um, we use very similar technology to, to human doctors, and that's because a lot of our patients, particularly if they're mammals like us, have similar health problems to people. So let's take taking orangutans, for example, um, which are closely related to us. We use blood tests like you might get in the clinic to look for infectious diseases like malaria. Um, we take x-rays to check for broken bones, um, and we use something called ultrasound, which can produce a picture of, of the tissues in your body. So we use that to scan for to see if they're pregnant and to look for things like heart disease. Um, if we're treating small animals, we often actually use equipment that's designed for human children. Um, and if we're treating very large animals like elephants, a lot of this equipment, although it's very similar to that that's used in people, um, it has to be designed and, and made especially for that purpose. The real difference comes um, when we're working with wild animals in their natural environment. So obviously, if, we work, if you're working with wild animals in a zoo, there's normally a veterinary clinic close by where you can, you can get access to this equipment. But when we're treating animals in forests or in savannas, then we have to carry our equipment to them. Um, and as a result, it has to be very portable. So where I work in Kenya, we have a special handheld um, x-ray machine and an ultrasound machine and blood testing machines. And these you can just plug into a car and, op and power them off that. And then you can drive straight up to the animal once it's been put to sleep and deliver the treatment that's required. Hello everyone, my name is Teresia Tulimau from Kupang. I am an alumni of Embassy's English Access Micro Scholarship Program. I would like to know, is the reasons to be hopeful about human and wildlife health? Thank you. Hi. Uh, Yes, um, I think there is. It's it can be difficult at times, but um, I'll I'll try and explain why why I am hopeful about human and wildlife health. Um, I think firstly we we really understand many of the reasons that people and wildlife fall sick uh, with the same diseases, and as I hope has been clear through this short conversation, that's primarily because of human activities. And because humans are responsible for this, the solutions are quite simple. Um, and it really becomes about education um, and encouraging people to change, um, to change their behavior. So as, a, as an example, um, making sure that people have access to alternative sources of food so that they don't um, feel the need or they, they don't have to hunt wildlife um, and also educating people about the risks of doing so um, is really important. And similarly with keeping exotic pets, you know, educating people that um, keeping a dog as a pet rather than keeping um, a, an animal that's been caught in the wild um, is, is really important. Having said that, if we, if we don't come together and act now and these educational programs have to be quite broad, um, then we will see new diseases in humans um, and we will find that more wild animals that are really important to us and to nature um, will disappear. I'm also hopeful because there are so many um, more opportunities now than when I was training um, to be a vet for young people who are just at the beginning of their careers and want to make a difference in wildlife health or conservation and human health um, to get the qualifications they need to do so. So there are, there are more opportunities to become a vet. Um, I think Indonesia has 12 veterinary schools, for example. But if, of course, you don't have to become a vet. You can also train as a biologist and then focus on wildlife and human diseases. Um, and we, as 
as scientists, we recognize the importance of offering these opportunities. Um, and as a result, we offer those at the Smithsonian. Um, and through the global health program that I work for, we run an international training program, um, which provides early career vets and scientists from countries like Indonesia with the opportunity to spend time learning from um, and meeting Smithsonian experts. So I guess to summarize, I am optimistic that we as humans can enact change. Um, and I think the more young people who are really passionate about um, the topic of One Health and wildlife health, um, I think that's really important. And I would encourage anyone who, who finds this interesting to, um, to read more and, um, yeah, and really take it up. Dr. Hassel, thank you for all of this valuable information. I think we are all more aware now of the close relationship between animals and the humans and the importance of education in this area of one global health. Thank you for, for your joining us. And thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure to be able to talk about th these things with, um, with people uh, up and coming generations. Berikutnya, mari kita berkunjung ke Myanmar, di mana kita akan melihat pekerjaan Dr. Hassel secara langsung. Here we are at Logan National Park. It's an 800-acre park located in northern Yangon. It is incredibly popular. Many school children and family groups come here just so they can interact with a wide variety of wildlife that live here. What we have behind me is a group of local tourists feeding sambar deer, which is a very endangered species within this country and within the entire region. There are various other species that are interacting with each other in close concentration. This includes over 1,000 macaques, as well as suids like pigs and wild boars, and then at night, thousands of bats, in addition to rodents. This is a really good opportunity for us as veterinarians in the Global Health Program to study the interaction between humans and animals, in particular, studying zoonotic viruses that can be transmitted between animals and humans. Behind me, we have a very large attraction, uh, it's elephants. So, of course, we're going to have a large group of people gathering up. In addition to concerns of the animal's well-being, nutrition, and care, one of the fears that we have as wildlife veterinarians is zoonotic disease like tuberculosis. And because this disease is the same in humans and elephants, the two species can share it. This is both a public health concern as well as a conservation concern Evaluating the presence in wildlife like elephants will help guide efforts to reduce or eliminate the spreading of the disease. We've already started conducting surveillance activity, which includes collections of mucosal swabs and blood samples. These samples are then sent to laboratories in Myanmar for viral analysis. The results of our work will help us understand what diseases are spread at these interfaces and will guide us in threat reduction for the safety and health of all species including humans. Sebelum kita mengakhiri episode hari ini, mari kita kunjungi Panama untuk melihat pekerjaan ilmuwan yang meneliti kehidupan nyamuk. The Asian tiger mosquito entered Panama in 2002. In less than 10 years, it colonized more than 70% of the national territory. How is it possible that a mosquito that only flies 300 meters can colonize a country so aggressively? The mosquito is actively using the transfer of used tires that are available throughout the main roads of the country. And in this tire, that probably comes from a shop in Panama City, there are eggs, larvae, and pupae. By involving the homeowners, asking permission and explaining what the project is about and the interest we have, they open their doors completely and let us work in their homes. Mosquitoes are without a doubt the most dangerous animals in terms of public health. We are trying to understand their behavior so we can devise sustainable control strategies. We are making sure that the army of people working against the mosquito grows exponentially, making our fight more effective. 
Kita semua percaya bahwa ilmu kesehatan itu sangat penting untuk dipelajari agar kita lebih paham mengenai virus dan pandemik, juga keseimbangan antara manusia dan hewan. Jika kalian masih penasaran dengan topik ini, silakan pergi ke website earthoptimism.se.edu untuk informasi lebih lengkap. Sampai jumpa di episode selanjutnya.